Good morning. In a recent video I used the term social engineering. I was talking about the UW project and I was talking about designing the site as being a little bit like social engineering and, and uh, I'm not sure it's the best term I could have used because clearly a couple of people are, are bristling slightly as a result of that term. And I can kind of understand why. I mean, I, don't, I haven't really looked into the history of the term social engineering, but I think it probably does have a history. And, and the sound of it is a little bit, um, I don't know, it sounds Machiavellian perhaps or manipulative. I think that's, that's what, what it feels like, you know, as if, as if someone, some kind of top-down authority is trying to organise a society to be placid or compliant or something like that and, so, and, uh, and turning humanity into a machine. So it, it maybe it does have all the kind of wrong metaphorical resonances. But I just wanted to explain what I mean by that and why I think in some ways it's, uh, it would be a tin man argument uh, to um, criticise the term without understanding where it comes from, I think. Because, you know, the way I look at it is, you know, if you are creating anything, you know, whether it be town planning or organising the way a room is laid out or uh, designing a garden space or in virtual terms, you know, designing a website, uh, particularly a social uh, a website in which people socially interact, which is the crucial thing here, that design process always constrains and enables certain kinds of social interactions. You know, there's no doubt about that. Um, in... Um, well, you know this probably from your own house, you know what I mean? Most houses in the West, certainly, have got a television in the corner and they've got uh, a set of chairs which more or less orient around the television set. It used to be the fireplace, but now it's the television set. Um, and that's constraining what kind of social activities can take place in there. You know, many households in the West, for example, probably at 50 or 60 percent, um, people don't eat around the dining table. They eat with the food on their laps in front of the television set. It's the orientation of the room is doing something very specific to the way that people are interacting with one another. Uh, the same is true in, in kind of business circles. There's a phrase that's in, in the business and management circles, which is to do with you know, organizing meetings and those kind of things. And the phrase is that a group behaves the way they look. It, it's, it's already used a bit, but the, the idea, a group behaves the way they look. So if you set up a room for a group meeting, and you set it up with the, the chairs in rows and then one chair at the front, people are going to come in there, sit on the chairs, and expect some kind of authority figure to give them some information. Even just, just as they walk in the door, they'll, be, they'll start to adopt that mindset. If you put them in a circle, they, op they occupy a different mindset, perhaps something to want to do with a more kind of democratic engagement. And actually, if you separate the chairs out, <laughs> keep them in rows, keep them facing towards the front, separate them from one another so, so there's about a three feet gap uh, and elevate the chairs at the front then you, you, you're getting into much more of a, kind of a very much of a kind of master servant relationship. Um, I would invite you to look at something like landmark forums that kind of thing which is large group awareness training meetings in which the, uh, the meeting rooms are set out to produce a very particular kind of hierarchical uh, authority kind of relationship. So and that's just an example of the way that social spaces are set up in order to promote certain kinds of social engagements uh, and, you, and you see it in architecture a lot of course and in town planning as I say um, and that's a kind of engineering you know it's, it's fully conscious engineering well I, I'm not sure it's always fully conscious but certainly these days it's fully conscious you know, when people design a room or design a building with any kind of forethought about what they want to happen in that room they should kind of know these things you know uh, and the same is true for virtual spaces, as I say, if you're designing a virtual space, you can't go in there naively, I don't think, and just say, well, I'll just use the tools that are available, or I'll just copy this social site, and, uh, and it'll all be natural, and people will just naturally do whatever they want, and people are just kind of, no, they don't do that, you know, people can't do that. If the social space isn't created, and en engineered, and I'm going to use that term here, in a, in a thoughtful way, then... Um, untoward kind of behaviours may take place. And the point is you can't not engineer it. You know, all design is an engineering process and also all design of social spaces is a social engineering process. You know, it's not something you can just leave to to kind of the unconscious intuitive processes. Well, you can, but if you do that, then you reproduce the conditions of that unconscious uh, intuitive processes have always produced. You, know, you, you get social situations being produced which are basically just what you're used to and that's not necessarily what you want. Um, I do just in terms of my own uh, developments with the UW site, 
I mean, I have been using biological metaphors as well to try to offset some of the more uh, engineering-based metaphors. And biology is certainly a useful metaphor. Biology and, eco and ecology is a useful set of metaphors. But it is only that, you know what I mean? I, mean, I know they're slightly more user-friendly. People feel more comfortable about around biological and ecological metaphors. But they are just metaphors, you know, make no mistake. Even if you're using a biological metaphor, you're still engineering the biology. You're still engineering the system. You're still designing something. You're just designing it teleologically. You're just designing it with an end in mind. Whereas biology doesn't have an end in mind. Uh, ecology doesn't have an end in mind. It's just about, well, you know what it's about. So, um, so the crucial thing is to get, kind of get some ends in mind. Now, not by that, I'm not talking about remote particular purposes. It might just be, the kind of environment you want to create, the kinds of social interactions. And I think that is quite important. If I can just contrast that with YouTube, the YouTube environment is, is a terrible ecology in my opinion, or it's been, it's been socially engineered, which is more accurate, to, um, to produce very certain kinds of social interactions. And the, and the way that ch the changes to the YouTube site more recently are, you know, again, ac acts of social engineering to promote particular kinds of social behaviours. And it is turning more and more into uh, a place that looks like a room with lots of chairs and then one chair at the front. And that's, that's kind of how it's working now, isn't it? You know, it becomes a popularity contest where we all sit placidly in our chairs. And yes, we might chat amongst ourselves for a while, but basically we're there to watch the big, uh, the big channels sitting on the chair at the front. That's kind of what we're there for. And uh, maybe buy things from the police world around us. That's kind of what it's there for. So... Um, so yeah, you can't not do social engineering. And quite honestly, social engineering, um, as long as the aims are understood and transparent and shared and ideally you know, crafted with the people around you, there's, there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, it's far better, a lot of the time, to do social engineering than to, do, than to leave it up to the whims of biology. You know, town planning, by, in biological terms, would not be a good idea, really, for, let's, let's, let's say, for example. In fact, look at, look at the way that... Um, the equivalent of town planning has happened in our biology. Our biology, the evolution of our biology, has put the, uh, the, the, the playground and the fun fair right next to the sewage factory in, in, our, in our biology. So that's a bit of town planning that's not fantastic. Town, the town planning in our biology produced shins and produced an appendix and produced you know, a lower back which can't really support the weight of the upper part of the body. So our town planning, this, this corporeal town planning, is not always, a, it's not always doing the right thing. Um, so, so quite a lot of the time, thinking ahead and engineering how a social system can work is going to produce better results. As I say, as long as, the, as long as it's reasonably transparent and there's some leeway and there's some slippage and there's plenty of room for spandrels to emerge. Spandrels or exaptations in biology are those um, kind of fortuitous things that emerge from uh, where, where one thing that's evolved gets used for something else. I think literally it's the, well, I don't know if it's literal or not, but I've, I've seen it applied to the, the bits of a church that run down the church. They were originally the parts under the flying buttresses to keep the walls up, and then people thought, oh, actually, we could put a roof on this, and we've got some nice aisles down the side. And that's, that's an example of a spandrel. It's something that emerges out of the construction and then finds a function. So, um, so as long as you're engineering a system that's got lots of opportunities for spandrels to come into it, that's providing lots of niches for new developments to emerge, then there's nothing, I don't think, anything wrong with engineering the system. There's less waste, there's less redundancy, you get to the optimal faster, and as long as it's transparent, it's uh, not a problem, is it, I don't think. Um, yeah, I think that's all I've got to say, really. Yeah, so social engineering... I know, it's, I know it rings alarm bells probably, but what I'm talking about that is just the thoughtful construction of social spaces uh, rather than the thoughtless construction of social spaces. If you don't think about how social spaces are going to be produced, they're going to be produced anyway, and they might not be the ones that you want. If you want to help me produce what kind of social spaces we're talking about, tell me what kind of social spaces you want. Let's have a public conversation about that. A public conversation in a public social space and uh, see how it goes from there. Anyway, thanks very much.